Good evening. I'm so happy to welcome you all tonight. My name is Kristen. I'm one of the librarians here at the, at the Batavia Public Library. This evening, we will be learning how to bring nature to our yards, part of our how-to community series of programs. And I would like to invite you to visit the Seed Library in the Adult Services Department when we're done here. Batavia residents can take up to five packets per person per season. There is a limit of two packets per variety per household. The Seed Library is open while supplies last. Next week on Thursday, April 4th at 7 o'clock, we hope you'll join us for Illinois weather and storm chasing. You can sign up for this and other great programs on our calendar at BataviaPublicLibrary.org. And now, our presenter, Jim Kleinwachter, is Conservation at Home Program Director for the Conservation Foundation, one of the region's oldest and largest not-for-profit land and watershed conservation organizations. Jim lectures all over the region on local environmental issues, and we're pleased to have him speak here tonight. Welcome, Jim. Thank you very much. Um, where it started for me was um, volunteering with the Conservation Foundation. And if you don't know who we are, we're a not-for-profit. We do everything environmental. And you may have heard some groups like Nature Conservancy conservation groups like that, they're nationwide and they can't come to Batavia and help with small projects. We work in Kane, Kendall, Will, DuPage. We're being pulled into Grundy, LaSalle, DeKalb, and we have sister organizations in Cook, Lake, McHenry. I'll show you some pictures um, of this network. And it wouldn't matter if you lived in Oklahoma or Florida or Georgia, there are land trusts like ours throughout the country and there's a network of them that um, are doing these small projects all over the area. Um, I do teaching at conservation at um, College of DuPage, and we have people doing land protection. We buy land for open space. We're cleaning up the rivers and streams. We're teaching people about things, and our base home is in Naperville, a 60-acre protected farm. 49 of the acres are in uh, organic vegetables now and we've taken the old farm the historic parts and fixed them up and then we've added this green infrastructure they call it so a green roof and wind turbines solar panels uh, a wetland restoration uh, butterfly gardens all of these things on that old farm so it's kind of a fun place to go some you know you're welcome to come I have information I'll have up in front about the program and, and about the farm itself. You can see where the road would have gone right through the farm had it not been for the protection of a conservation easement placed on the property. And the farm carries Lenore McDonald's name because she was the one that protected the property in perpetuity. So it will be a farm forever. And that's the strength of these conservation easements. We hold 50 conservation easements across six counties and where it started for me was I went back to the area along the river that I used to fish so I live in Warrenville it was a two-page river and this is the picture I took of the morning I went back to look at my old fishing hole and it made me sick and so I called the mayor and I said you know what are you gonna do about this and the answer was we don't have any money we're not gonna do anything and I kind of got angry. I said, well, it's not about money. It's about people caring for the land. And she said, well, it sounds like you should do it. <laughs> so um, I said, okay. So I uh, put an ad in the paper. I said, Saturday morning, I'll bring garbage bags. We're going to clean it up. I called the public works director and I said, do you have a dumpster in the city? No. Do you clean up anything? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, we clean up what's along the road. And I said, okay, that's enough. So Monday I called him, I said, you know, there's a big pile over here, over there. And um, 
So he wasn't particularly happy about this whole thing, but um, that started me on the program. Um, and the thing that I talk to people about is, I know my kids will not throw things in the river or uh, they're cognizant about littering because they participated in the program. And uh, to this day, I've had them engaged in different things and um, it's all about how you get connected. So I got a call from the Conservation Foundation when this hit the paper, that local group cleaning up river. And we had these, the, this picture of my kids with this pile of junk. And so I got a call from the Conservation Foundation. At the time they had one employee and she was the sweetest person ever. And she said, well, you're cleaning up Warrenville, but what about Naperville? What about West Chicago? And I said, let them do their own thing. I'm not gonna clean up the world, you know? I'm trying to clean up my town. And she says, well, we're having some meetings. And I said, I don't wanna go to meetings. I wanna do something. And she's like, I'll bake you cookies. <laughs> so I went to the meeting and here I am. Um, now they pay me though. So I was a volunteer for about 10 years and uh, it started the river cleanup in, on the DuPage. Now it goes from the beginning to the end. So it goes from uh, Hanover Park down to Shorewood. And uh, we're working on the Fox River too with the groups that are already working here. So the idea is if we want Illinois, if we want Batavia to be a nice place, we have to think about private property. So you look at the second line there, 95% is private property across the state. And we're blessed in our areas to have forest preserves are a, a, a big part of it. But if you go into like LaSalle County, they have nothing. They have no forest preserves and everything is open to be paved over. So we're buying up land there just because if you don't protect it, it will be gone. So in this uh, quote by Kellert in his book, Birthright, we're not gonna be help, ha healthy and happy if we're apart from where we evolved. And we were from cavemen. We came from Little House on the Prairie and we were outside. We were much more outdoors than we are now. And in this picture, my son, I guided him to his first big muskie. I'm hiking the Appalachian Trail there. If I asked you about your experiences, you'd tell me that your grandpa had a farm up in Wisconsin or you played in the woods. All these wonderful memories that we have when we go on vacation, people don't like really grasp. I just got back from uh, Puerto Rico and I swam with manatees. Um, you know, we pay money to fly the, the heck out of Dodge and go to some wonderful natural place. The only two places I can think of that are not natural would be maybe New York City or Las Vegas. Otherwise, we're going to see something pretty. We go to Florida to be by the ocean. We go to California to see the ocean there, or we go to some wonderful wooded place, Maine or wherever. And the idea is bringing some of that back to home. We can't go to the forest preserve every day. We're busy with our lives, but be able to able to sit out and have a cup of coffee and look at nature and the things that it brings with it is an important part. This quote by Bromfield, he talks about the war against nature and nobody stands up and says to me, well, there's, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no war against nature. I mean, you've seen it even in Batavia, what they've paved over and the big warehouses they're building, Amazon and trucks everywhere and there's more traffic than there used to be and air pollution and all these issues that we have are direct relationship to what people have done and how are we going to go back go back to and and make things a little bit better we have to do it incrementally it's not going to go back to the beginning um, the way it was a hundred years ago for example so we want to reconnect with nature and in this picture I'm with my granddaughter, took her fishing, my son and his best buddy. You can see a lot of times how if you're a gardener, you like to be outside, you're in the soil, 
These are all indications, house plants, um, pets. All these things are indicators to us that we're seeking more nature. And I don't know how much more there has to be before we finally turn the light on. I think maybe people, um, as you get older, you kind of realize things a little bit more than your kids do. I'm always pushing my kids to get the get their kids outside more. And uh, my daughter-in-law told me that she has a problem. And I said, what's that? And she goes, the, my granddaughter likes bugs. Mm -hmm. And I said, what's wrong with that? Mm -hmm. You can make a rule, they can't come in the house. But she rings the doorbell and she's got some bug in her hand mm -hmm. and she doesn't seem at all afraid. And I'm like, good job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have to kind of understand when I, when I do some of these lectures that we are animals. And people look at me funny, but we are mammals, we are primates, and we act like animals. We, you know, we don't want to admit that. Um, we're classified as intellectually superior. I'm not sure about that. We're the only animal that ruins the place that it lives. So understanding that a little bit more, we, they take animals into hospitals and retirement centers Animals heal us. They are making um, all kinds of medicines that come from plants. We are connected to the natural world. We just kind of don't think about it that way. So I try to bring that out to people. My background is in sales and marketing. And when I went to work for a conservation group, they don't get it. We have, we've been around for 52 years and they say well, we're the best kept secret and I'm like, you don't want to be a secret when you're a not-for-profit that you're dependent on donations. Um, so I set up out, up, upon my duty to try to tell people about all these wonderful things we do and how people can get connected. And we put together the Conservation at Home program to kind of help people. I realized at an early point, it doesn't matter what books you've read. Um, the library's full of beautiful books. Doug Tallamy is a great author, and he writes beautiful uh, books and beautiful pictures are in these books about how natural areas can be but then there's a break between that looks good in the book but how would I do that how would I connect that and because there's that gap people don't know I get these comments all the time that gee I'd like to I know what I'm doing isn't right but I would not not know where to start and so we do that with conservation at home program starting with simple things Nobody at this point stands up and said, that's crazy. You know, you're asking that. Um, gentle things, we're going to less chemicals, we're going to plant diverse tree species, we're going to make our soil better and solve problems. So starting the book at the very beginning, we don't understand plants very much. Un understanding plants would mean that plants are essential for all life. And I can't emphasize that enough. This planet is the only planet that grows plants like this. If people weren't here, that wouldn't cause any problem. It would actually be, probably be better for the plant growth. But the plants are the basis for all food. So sunlight comes and strikes the earth. The only way it can turn into food is photosynthesis. These plants can do this amazing process that science can't even replicate. And the plant just does it. So understanding that the air we have, the, the water we drink, everything is based on plants. So once we understand that, then the next step is it makes a difference what plants we pick. If I had different plants on the table and you were hungry, and over here I had a geranium and a cactus, and over there there was a bowl of broccoli and a, some bananas, nobody would couldn't decide where to go. You'd know right to go for food. And the same thing is happening. This hummingbird is coming back and he's looking for food. So we can understand it. We can say, if he doesn't come to your yard, it's because you haven't put anything in your yard that he wants. So we've done everything across the area to change the landscape from how it was and we have to decide if you want to go back or not. 
So in the evolutionary world, we understand a giraffe has a long neck to eat the acacia leaves. A turtle carries its shell around for protection. Um, a fox is smart enough to catch the mouse in the snow. We understand that there's a process and it, it's all evolutionarily programmed, but we don't see it in plants. This is hidden underground. So if you look at on the far left here at the base of that silhouette, that's turf grass. And I'll talk about more about that later. It came from Europe. But the native plants have these huge root systems. You've seen them burn the prairie down. The reason that doesn't ruin the prairie or kill the prairie is because they put what they need below ground. In Illinois, we have hot days, we have cold days, we have wind, sleet, hail, tornadoes. And the only way these plants have survived this long is by protecting their, themselves. The critical parts are below ground. So they build these big root systems. Many of them don't need rain. They get groundwater and they're building soil. They've, you know, the rich topsoil we have in the United States, it isn't from glaciers bringing it here. This is from prairies making soil. So, you know, this is the breadbasket of the United States right here in the Midwest. This was all prairie. And kind of understanding that the plants make the soil better, which makes it better for them, which makes them more sustainable, and the whole system functions well. But we've broken that system. And then I try to show people, like, do we have to bring things from China when we can have the plants of Illinois, how pretty they are. This is in Glen Ellen, and they don't have any grass in the front yard. Now, not that everybody's going to do this, but there are tricks. So we're looking at clumps of plants to look more organized. Our eyes are looking for structure. And when it's that wild prairie, that might not be accepted in the front yard. So we have ways of doing it. And, um, and I'll go through some of those and show you some of the pictures. We've been working my program across the region. My area is the bright red. And then we've got Cook County in the blue and up in Lake County in the dark red. We're into Wisconsin, parts of Michigan. I'm talking to people in Indiana and Iowa to make this a regional type program. And then if it wasn't for at the home site, we have another sister program that we do it on work sites. So it could be a hospital, it could be you know, you name it. The picture you're seeing there is the Shedd Aquarium. You typically think of the Shedd Aquarium as a building full of fish, but they realized at an early point that only something like 40% of the people that came to the Shedd Aquarium property went in the building. A part of it is it costs about $40 to go in the building, but there's people riding bikes and rollerblading by and, and the exterior connection to nature was very important to them. So they put in a rain harvesting system where all the water from the roof ends up in this uh, fountain area that the birds can drink from. They planted along the lake shore native plantings that the birds can f and feed on when they come migrating along the lake. There's a lot of wonderful things that can happen if we allow it. And from my background in sales, it's a lot about solving problems. If you can visualize that this would be better for me, you're not going to go about a change unless you can see that it's worth the effort. What's in it for me is the, the old expression. And when I show you how this could benefit you with water issues, poor soil, bringing birds and butterflies, um, planting things that would not only bring color and structure to your yard, but also help with problems. <laughs> Park districts we work a lot with, and this picture I'm standing on a bridge and there was a mink that swam across the creek there. So much of the land the parks own is not conducive to ball fields. So now we're walking with the grandchildren or we're taking the dog for a walk and having these natural areas available to us that are restored are an important thing. In this picture, we took a mud hole, a ditch, and we made it a bioswale. Mm -hmm. So some of it's marketing, we, but we have a place for the little bunny to hide when the mowers are coming around. We're mowing less of the park, 
and that cost savings is passed down in our taxes. So we can do these types of things in small ways and it's a win-win situation because the park's mowing less, we've created habitat, there's a place for monarchs and, and bees and um, getting closer to nature can be everywhere. So I sell a lot of butterflies. People just love butterflies or birds. I don't have anybody that comes to me and says, can you bring snakes to my yard? Can you bring possums? Can you bring skunks? They love butterflies. We sell the butterflies. The reality of it is that the bees do most of the work, but it doesn't matter. Uh, pollination happens with butterflies too. And while people are looking at the butterflies, the bees are in doing their work. Uh, a lot of schools and different places, they're like, well, if we build these gardens, the bees won't come there. Oh, no, don't worry about it. You know, we're not going to we're not going to see the bees. So, using that universal love of butterflies on the on your right, you're looking at a milkweed that was decimated by the caterpillars eating it. And uh, some of the stories, milkweed is poisonous. So the plant has, over time, developed poisons, and they transmit um, a certain smell. So your dog won't eat it, a horse won't eat it, nothing wants to eat a milkweed. It's got a certain smell and that the milk itself in the milkweed is sticky and it's just a repellent for almost all the insects and all the animals, no one wants to touch it. And the relationship the monarchs have with it, they have evolved to um, utilize the poison. So they, the mother lays the egg on the plant, the baby eats the poisonous plant, the baby becomes poisonous, and birds don't want to eat an orange butterfly. So you see the connection there. Other, there's the most common butterfly we have is orange, and viceroys and some other types of butterflies have mimicked the monarch. They're not poisonous, but since they're orange, they get a free pass from the birds. So this is how nature functions. And if I can bring a little bit of that light bulb moment to say like, wow, um, then maybe I can stir people into doing things. Show them it's simple. Look at these pretty flowers. This is blazing star. And all you have to do is plant it and things will come and utilize it. Not all milkweed is the common milkweed, the big one that you're used to seeing. This is a short growing milkweed, very beautiful orange flowers. It likes it hot and dry. So if you got a sunny spot that hardly gets any rain, this is a perfect plant for it. There are other ones that will take water and shade. There are families of plants. So there's three or four common milkweeds in our area and then some more rare ones. But um, all of these ones that I'm showing you tonight have a family of plants. That blazing star I showed you there's one that likes wet, there's one that likes shade, so we can find one for your spot. So my daughter-in-law and granddaughter were in Chicago and my son found a little milkweed that was growing in the side of a planter. It was pur not purposely put there, it just blew in there. And on that milkweed was a little caterpillar. You can see she's pointing to it on the right slide. And they put it on her arm, and of course the little feet were going, and she's getting with the willies. And they told me the story and showed me the pictures, and I got them a container and put three monarch caterpillars in there so that they could watch this whole thing happen. And my daughter's like, I don't know about this. And um, then I got a call that she named them. <laughs> Coco, Banana, and Super. And then I got a call, Grandpa, they're dead. They're all hanging from the top and they're in this J. And I said, they're not dead. They look dead. Mm -hmm. I said, Just relax. My daughter-in-law calls me and then she says, she's an engineer, very smart. She says, it went in there, yellow, orange, or uh, yellow, white, black. And there's, I know the color wheel. You cannot mix mm -hmm. green, black, yellow, it'll never be orange. And I said, you're right, but there's magic. That caterpillar ceases to be, 
and there's a gelatinous thing going on inside there and somehow that turns into this orange butterfly. Chemical reactions, all this stuff's happening in there. She got freaked out by, what kind of a mother is that? She flies down, drops the egg, I'm out of here. <laughs> I said, that's the way it works. Well, who teaches the baby what to eat? Who teaches him to stay out of the street or whatever? And I said, it's all programmed. Um, so she, you know, her whole thing is caring for the baby and this, you know, this system is vastly different. So it just blew her mind. And then when they came out and how fragile they were and watched them, you know, open up and dry out. And then I told them they have to fly to Mexico. It was September. And she's like, what are you, crazy? You know, that, that thing can't fly to Mexico. And I said, well, it either flies to Mexico or dies trying. Those are the two choices that it can make. So. It just, by bringing some of these elements to people and how amazing this can be, makes them want more. She's, my daughter-in-law said, we need more milkweed. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I can rest, rest easy now. So I go to people's homes. The lady said, well, come in the back. I gotta show you where we have a lake. And I went back there, and there's a picture on the left. Um, I said, it doesn't look like a lake to me. And she said, well, it is in May and this is compacted clay, very poor soil. So if you live in a subdivision, the developer scraped off all that topsoil and sold it. You got a couple inches back on top of either compacted clay or rock. And a lot of these plants don't require rich soil, the native ones. And why aren't we composting and enriching the soil with organic material again? So we, we sell composters, we sell rain barrels. The whole idea is teach people about it, see if it makes sense to them, sell it to them for a lower price than normal, and maybe you can make some um, changes. Birds are an easy thing for me to sell. So top right, bottom left, invasive species. They're from Europe, they don't belong here, and they're overpopulating the area. The other two, the grackle and the Canadian geese, they are native, but they've gone crazy in our sub, uh, subdivisions. So they've adapted to suburbia and their populations went crazy and now we're dealing with issues. So people don't want this. You know, look at the colors when I switch the channel here. These birds are the native ones, the ones we want and cause very little problems. We don't have to feed them. We do feed this group and it's fine. Feeders are fine. They give additional food source during the winter but birds have to be able to live on their own. They can't, we can't be thinking that we're gonna feed them all through the winter everything they need. And really what the birds eat, they'll eat seeds, this group will eat seeds in the winter. Um, other ones like the hummingbird down there, he flies away and the next group I'll show you also flies away. But the, what we feed the hummingbird is sugar water that's not sustainable. So that's like me drinking a Pepsi. It's not going to give me long-term food. It's a short-term boost, which they get from sugar also. And an understanding that they eat ants. And they cannot get ants from grass. So they're reliant on our landscape to feed even something like the hummingbird. This group are called snowbirds. We know that concept because we've copied it from the birds, but they fly south to get out of here. There's no bugs in the summer or in the winter here. So they're gone, they go to Arkansas and Florida and then they, they'll come back again. But all the birds, all the birds in Illinois eat bugs, even the bald eagle. They feed grasshoppers to their babies because the young need that high protein, and there's more protein in a grasshopper than there is in beef or fish. So bugs are essential, and the bugs are on the plants from here. There's ways to grow food. We don't have to think about bird food being in a bag I got from the hardware store. There's a lot of plants that they'll find food from, and there's a lot of plants that they will not find food from, 
And if you're questioning, is it connected to the environment or not, all you have to do is Google where it came from. So take the bottom one, for example, lilacs. Very nice, beautiful smell. You'll never see a bee on a lilac. So it's about connectivity and function. So in the house, we build a house with function. We build a kitchen, the bathroom, the bedroom, the couch, those things we need. Then you decorate. You put a little something on the mantle, you put some flowers up, you put something in the front yard, you put a picture on the wall. Decorative things are non-essential decor and we don't think about it that in landscaping. We need function and then we can use decorative. Everything that is comes from somewhere else falls into that decorative. It's pretty, roses or any of those things, they might be pretty and you might enjoy them and it's okay, but it's decorative. And it has about the same function as like a gazing ball or a concrete block or a plastic gnome. It's not connected to the environment. So as long as we don't go crazy with any one thing, we can have some of this and some of that. So people come to me and they'll say, well, can you fix this? Well, this is Death Valley. This is like, so I, I was today, I was at Monarch Landing, which is a big retirement center on Route 59. And there, I'm walking around looking at sites like this. This is downtown Naperville. Right next to uh, the building here is City Hall. And so you look at some site like this, and I'm sure when you're out in your community, you see sites that are just not pretty. And to understand when I start with bad, then it's, you're wondering like, what could you do with that? And then I show them what we did. And we're, in this picture, we're, we're inviting people in. We want them in there. We want to see and smell and touch. And you're looking at bee balm and prairie drop seed and cone flowers in the background. The idea is things can be fixed and when you start with bad you can only go up from there. So I get questions like well I live in a home how would we do it on a residential site? So in this particular one that people have no birds, they have no butterflies, they have a problem with water it drains down onto the sidewalk and they're saying, well, how would we implement conservation practices on this yard? Notice the large arborvita that are overgrown there. We're revealing the stonework. Look at that handmade stone cutting that was done on this property and how pretty that uh, brick house is. And we've lowered the landscape, so it's not rocket science to understand water is going to go down to the low spot. The sidewalk was lower than the landscape, so the water pooled on the sidewalk. We lowered the landscape down, directed the downspouts away from the sidewalk and let that infiltrate in the ground. We kept some grass and a defined edge and we put in these native plants where they will have birds and butterflies coming to their yard, less mowing. So this happens everywhere and whether it's an HOA situation or a park, I don't want to put a blanket down and have a picnic with my grandkids there. You know it's loaded with goose poop. You know it's been sprayed for dandelions. And you see erosion on the shoreline. It's not a good place to fish if you're a fisherman. And it's not particularly pretty. So why are we paying for this? Some guy's going to try to get down there with his mower and risk his life. Um, so does it make a lot of sense? And there's huge problems with erosion. You're seeing it in the river when you see brown water going by with soil being carried downstream. And the answer would be to make it more eco-friendly, the way it was when the settlers came here. And the geese are gone. They're terrified of their main predators would be a fox, coyote, dog. And they can't see them in here. It takes them a long time to get going. They need a vista of grass so they can see the predator coming at them. So they will not walk through this. You're going to get herons and egrets instead of geese. You're going to have the egrets eating frogs along the shoreline, bass 
and other game fish will be able to find forage food along the shoreline. Can I sell those homeowners on this concept is the question that the, their kids could go out and catch a praying mantis or see a monarch or catch a snake or um, would that be valuable to those subdivision owners? So I show them pictures, of course, like this picture is from probably July or August and it doesn't quite look like that today, but I'm selling the concepts. And then you see pictures like this where that orange is milkweed and what surface looks better to you. And this is a buffer along a creek. We're doing the wrong things with our lawns. I used to sell fertilizer. That first number up there, the 32, that's nitrogen, high nitrogen fertilizer. You don't want that on your lawn. You can kill the lawn at different times a year. If you put that down in, in July, it'll just burn your lawn out. What it does is it makes the grass grow faster. So if you want it to grow, so you have to mow twice a week, there you go. They're not selling you what you want. What you want is healthy grass on the areas you have grass. It'd be a much lower number and a more balanced fertilizer, one that would feed the roots of the plant, not just make it grow. So we're doing the wrong things. A lot of that nitrogen is ending up in the river. The algae bloom in the river is causing problems. When it's running green or brown, that means it's over nutrified. It's called eutrophication when water is over nutrified, which the Fox River definitely is suffering from eutrophication. The algae bloom causes um, drop in uh, oxygen. With low oxygen, the fish are impacted. The birds that eat the fish, the whole thing is, is broken down. And we're sending that down the Mississippi. Fox is connected to the Illinois, into the Mississippi, and it goes to New Orleans with poor water quality from what happens here and all the way up into Minnesota. We're covering the United States with grass. So the green states are the grass dominated states. In Illinois, there's more grass than corn and soybeans together. And the only states that are not grass are sparsely populated, mountainous um, desert, in the case of Nevada. Um, so if people go, people will want their grass. And it's part of the problem. So you look at $40 billion in grass care annually, an average of $500 per household, and it's biologically dead. There's nothing that can live in that, really, other than Japanese beetles in the, in the soil. So does it make a lot of sense what we're doing with our, our I guess it would be like um, just love of lawns, and we're not suggesting you don't have any, on the library areas, Wrigley Field, there's a lot of places we want some grass. That's fine, but let's balance it and we could have less. This is right in Geneva along the river walk. So left or right, which one's prettier? Which one is bringing monarchs and critters like little rabbits and different things? The orange again is milkweed. And which one have we chose? We've chose the left for to cover the state, cover the United States with. And does it make a lot of sense when we know how much money we're spending? Thomas Jefferson is the one that gets the credit for bringing grass over at Monticello. And he had people say, said to him like, well, that stuff takes a lot of care. Well, I don't care, I have a staff. And very costly, I don't care, I'm rich. And from that humble beginning, everybody wanted a piece of that action. I want a little grass in my yard so I can be like a rich person. Um, and we've absorbed the cost over time and not really noticed the negative effect it's had on the rest of the life. Trees are another thing that we educate people about. There's good trees and bad trees. So you can read about trees. Al Gore was the one that said, plant a tree, save the world. Well, it's not that easy. We're, trees can be classified from best to worst. And in our area, the, high, the highest tree is an oak tree in Illinois. And the oak tree populations are down about 70% from what they were. We've cleared whole oak forests to um, put in housing areas. 
you look at towns like Oak Park and there's not that many oaks left. Um, they're not regenerating because all the acorns they drop don't get um, a chance. They're weed eating and mowing our lawn and the oak trees never get a chance to repopulate themselves and creating diverse landscapes. We didn't learn from the trees when we planted elms back in the 50s and they all got Dutch elm disease and wiped them all out. And then we planted ash and we had the emerald ash borer that killed all the ash trees. Now we're over planting maple and honey locust. We're telling the communities like stop, we're somewhere at the 30% line. We should be high, no higher than 15% of any one tree. And if you went to these communities, all of them, you're finding 30% maple uh, easily and maybe 30% honey locust. So between those two, you've got 60% of all your tree species. So we're trying to urge people to diversify the tree and um, canopies and even the communities to say in the parkway, don't allow, don't plant maples for at least 10 years and let don't give people the choice, pick a maple, because they know maple, and I could give them a list of these other trees, and they would say, well, the maple sounds good, not knowing. We try to bring that to people. Many of the trees we brought over, like buckthorn, was brought over from Europe. Honeysuckle came from Asia. Uh, Bradford pear, or the calorie pear, is going to be on the inv invasive species list eventually. It's a horrible problem, but the industry is not allowing that to be listed right now because they're still trying to sell their inventory. But that will be on the, the list uh, soon. And then where we have trees, I went to this yard and they have these beautiful white oaks and the grass. So grass is not a friend of a tree. They don't ever belong together. If you went in the woods, if you went to any of the forest preserve and went to the wooded areas, there's no grass in the woods. But we have to have grass in our woods and the leaves that fall are the food for the tree and we can't leave those leaves on our grass so we bag them we shred them we put them in paper bags we rake them you know all the stuff we do to get rid of that tree um, litter and that's actually what the soil needs most and what the tree needs for its generation next year so i show people like if you didn't have the grass there, look at the Virginia bluebells. This is the time to go see the woods in the next month. To see the, you're looking at wild geranium here. This is Carex. It looks like grass, but it's actually a sedge, and it does much better under trees, allowing air and water mo uh, movement. That's woodland phlox, that dark purple there. Beautiful woodland species that we can have in these shaded areas if we could give up our grass. So the pollution in the fox, you can see it now, it's called non-point source pollution or runoff. All the high areas, we're built with homes. We're getting the water running off, carrying debris. It carries salt from the roads. Uh, PAH, it's um, hydrocarbons from blacktop. We put the coating on our driveways and that gets scraped off in the winter with snow plow. That ends up in the snow, which then melts and washes into the storm drain. They're measuring the amount of asphalt that's in the river, and it's diminishing some of the fish. So between the salt, the nutrients, and other chemicals that are washing off our land, we have, that's the number one source of pollution now is runoff. And all the areas that we have are loaded with these drains. So all the communities, on the, you see them on the curbs, and throughout the subdivisions, there are drain systems that drain directly in the river. So that water is not going to a treatment plant, no one's cleaning it, it's not getting filtered at all. Storm water goes in the river. And if you looked at, this is a picture from, um, this is on Route 30 in Montgomery, right by uh, the Farm and Fleet kind of area. It's the Montgomery Police Station and they have native plants around the outside of the pond. That arrowhead on the right is actually growing in the water, pulling nutrients from the water, and look how nice that water looks. So we try to bring that education to people about how these rain gardens and rain barrels are ways of absorbing rain, and we want to keep it 
where it falls. If you could absorb your water and your neighbor absorbed his, we wouldn't be dumping it all in the river so quickly. You see, when it rains, the water in the river goes up immediately, and that's not what we want. We would like to keep it away from the water, from the river, and let it slowly go into the river, not so quickly, because we all live downstream is the term. The Fox River comes from the chain of lakes, and the chain of lakes uh, comes from all of the Mississippi starts in up by Minneapolis and winds its way down and then we're sending it here to Yorkville and on downstream so what we do to it on this end of it is important in this picture what we're showing is plantings on the upside of the drain so when the water comes towards the drain all engineered that we can absorb some of that water we can filter some of that water so that it doesn't dump in once it dumps in, the other side, nowhere near your home, is where it dumps into the river and causing this environmental damage. At the farm, we have uh, a rain garden we built, and I show this picture from beginning to end. So in this picture, you're seeing me and my boss just creating a shallow depression. Behind me are rocks that are gonna go onto that rubber mat so the mat is tipped so that it keeps it away from the basement. The rocks are gonna slow that water down and it's gonna sit into that basin and get absorbed. And then voila, we have flowers. And we don't have to mow, it takes care of all the water on this side of the property. So that's what we're trying to do is show people there are answers for some of the problems and that we will come to your house if necessary. You've heard the term, well, that's the least I could do. Well, I figure if I give you information and give you education and I offer to come to your house free, that's the most I could do. And if you're not ready, I understand, but at least you know where there is help. So I can take questions um, or you can hear about how, how to get somebody to come to your house. Over here. I have a couple questions. When you showed the slide of the erosion by the river, and then the next slide had um, natives plants on it. How do the native plants, planting them by the erosion, how does that keep the erosion from happening? Those deep roots that you saw in those other um, pictures hold the soil. So grass, turf grass is very short. You can actually buy sod with the little you know, root system on it. So by getting the sod off and those deep roots planted, you hold the soil intact, and so it doesn't get, um, doesn't cave in the sides and cause erosion like that. Would it be any native you could plant or any specific native? Uh, pretty much any native has those root systems. Um, in that picture that I showed from the Montgomery Police Station, um, oh, this one, people were saying, well, how did, how did that happen? Like up here, this is uh, purple prairie clover. It likes it dry. And you don't see any of the purple prairie clover down by the water. And what it was, was we seeded it. So we, we created, you can't have a vertical slope. So we created a, a slope that was stable and then we seeded it. And the plants that want it dry did really well up here. So we didn't go through all the process of like Let's try this one over here. Let's try that one over there. We planted in the seed mix, there was dry loving seeds, wet loving seeds. Everything got seeded together in a mix. And if, if it was the, the prairie clover that was down by the water just died. And the stuff at the top did really well. So the plants will self-select. We have information here about um, the native plants and to help you make a more informed decision. I've got sheets on rain gardens and on native plants. So the, the book you could get in the library would be uh, Native Plants to the Chicagoland Region. It's made by, uh, created by Swink and Wilhelm. But before you go write that down and read that book, 10 seconds into that book, you're gonna close the book and say, I can't, I can't do this. It's very technical. Um, telling you about the history of the plants back in, you know, 1800s, this plant used to be used for whatever. All this information that you wouldn't find useful. So I made 
a plant list there. It's like natives for dummies or a 101 kind of a situation. And I put little icons that birds like me, butterflies like me, I like water, I need full sun. Those little icons that people can see. And, and then on the back it says, if you're still confused, call Jim. <laughs> so we've done everything we can to try to help you and then give you the information. If you have questions, you call or you email. And I put my email up here and I'm sure the library can send it to you if you wanted that. The people that participated can get a hold of the email, which is real easy because it's um, rather than calling and then you get my voicemail and then I call you back and get your voicemail, we can put your address and different things on the uh, papers and we have documents that we can use. So there's information on the Conservation at Home program up here. There's even, um, if you're tech savvy, you can take a picture of the QR code and go right to our website. Other questions, yes? Uh, I have a question about uh, grass replacement, like a, a grass that's not too high growing that would be native that Um, it, it's not turf replacement. That's not a good term. So if we're suggesting that you reduce the turf area right. and plant other things. That prairie drop seed that I showed is a nice one. Um, the carex sedges look like grass and they grow in the shade. Uh, if you are going to have grass, you can plant clover. is a really good thing to add to your soil. So. There isn't anything that is going to look like grass and act like grass and not be grass. So the place I was today at Monarch Landing, they had large areas of grass on a slopey hill and he says like, we want to change all that. I'm like, no. They're, I mean, you start with, they had uh, like three trees in a triangle and I said, each one had a big tree circle and if you made that one area instead of three separate tree triangles and then plant it in there, you've reduced the amount of grass. But the idea of um, some magical thing I could do instead of grass, but I want it to look like grass. So we still have something in our head about we need to have grass to be like my neighbors. And if you're in a subdivision, you don't want your neighbor complaining. So we make the beds bigger, make the grass area easier to mow, but less grass, things like that, instead of thinking about tearing it all up and putting something else in there. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. There are, there are things you have to grow in the grass, you said, like clover. Clover would be the best thing, but you can't be spraying like a broadleaf killer that kills dandelions will also kill clover. So um, in my area, in the back of my yard, I have a lot of shade and the grass has slowly died away and I'm introducing sedges that are grass-like. My son said, like, I thought you were going to get rid of that grass. I said, I did. Well, it doesn't look any different to me. And I said, well, that's the trick. You know, like, if you can do it and it doesn't look crazy, then it goes under the radar. Do you have anything on those kinds of sedges? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there is some information in here, not specifically. Um, there's a hundred different types of sedges. So if it's shade, if it's wet, different ones. Some get tall and some stay short. So um, I can help you with those details. Yes? So these landscapes that you showed that were redone, <clears throat> were done with seeds? Mostly not. Um, that we've gone to the, like, greenhouse and try to find plants that are going to attract uh, hummingbirds, butterflies. And they're like $40, $50 a piece. You know? yeah. Well, most of the time you're going to use plants. Um, the one I showed from uh, the Montgomery Police Station, those were seeded. Large areas, acreage, the Forest Preserve are going to seed and it takes two or three years. In a situation where you want a garden in the front, you're going to put plants. Uh, Wasco Nursery, there are some nurseries that specialize in native, 
the typical you know Home Depot or whatever are not going to have what you want. So we help you with that. In May, there's a lot of plant sales. Um, here, there's the Batavia Black Dirt Gardeners. Okay, Plain Dirt Gardeners. They have a nice plant sale, and there's places I know it's beautiful walking um, up around the gazebo at uh, on the river there and seeing what the woodland looks like. So that's a beautiful area right here in Batavia. You're looking at forest preserves that have a lot of the native areas. So the plant sales are great in early May, but we also help people find plants throughout the season. Way in the back. So um, I have a shaded area under maple trees. Um, and so there's mulch there, shredded mulch. Do you need to remove the mulch before you start putting plants there? Or do you can you put some of these plants right into the mulch? Right something? in the mulch. Right into the mulch. Yep. And you're, you know, if it's if it's a shaded area, mm -hmm. you want to pick um, we're doing if it's a if it's near a sidewalk or someplace where it's highly visible, you you buy clumps of things like maybe three of the same and let it become a clump so it looks organized. But um, there's the mulch unless it's volcanic mulch or pea gravel or something like that, it's going to degrade and enrich the soil eventually. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Two questions. Um, when you were showing the trees up there, the good trees and the bad trees, where does the, is it the Norwegian spruce, is that what it is? is Austrian no, the, pine, no. or there's a Colorado spruce, no. blue blue those, spruce. The, those things all got funguses in this whole thing. <laughs> yeah. but they, we, and we had ours replaced with Norwe, Norwe, Norway, Norway, Norway spruce. spruce. Yeah. Norway spruce. Okay. How, where, how are those? Are those on the good side? Or the well, good? you can guess where it came from. <laughs> um, there's Siberian elms, there's, you know, most of the time they tell you. Um, there's nothing wrong with a Norway spruce, but they're more susceptible to uh, disease. So you bring a Colorado spruce to Illinois and somebody says, well, it gets disease. Well, it's not in its home turf. You can't do that with other, you know, like try bringing a penguin here and expect it to live or something. You know, we don't really think about it that we're just importing stuff. The, the only true evergreen that we have is white pine. And they're growing out White Pine State Park and other places like that. So um, we, there's nothing wrong with some of those pines that we brought here. But knowing that they're susceptible at some point, uh, Arborvita, a lot of these different things are either not from here or they've been modified. So when you see, anytime you see a name on it, so like Little Princess or whatever name is in there in quotes, that means it's been modified genetically to be bigger or prettier or some kind of thing. And when you start modifying it so much that it might not be stable anymore, it may not be sustainable long term. So but the white pine is native to here? Yeah. Are there variations of white pine that isn't native, or any of this white pine? Most of the time, the I mean, there are there's species that are that you can look up to be native. A lot of times, you're going to find if you go to a nursery, they're going to have the cultivated ones with the name on them. But that was done for a purpose, and the, you know, it's not necessarily horrible when the, you choose those, but just know that you are choosing something that's been modified. And then, and then, okay, you see that cornflower up there? Mm -hmm. So, I was at a, sh it was so confusing. I was at a flower show and I was going to buy a bunch of coneflowers because they were native. And then there were so many different brands, like a sombrero that was way prettier than yeah. even that one. Right. And then I said, is this native still? If it's sombrero, and I think it's not. So no, it's not. All coneflowers are not native. Well, again, when you, when you see the name sombrero or little Kim or um, hot lips or these n different names on them, they're modified. And the problem is that nobody knows what those modifications were. We know the flower is a different color. They don't know, like for example, this is the native coneflower. There's two coneflowers, there's pale purple coneflower and uh, purpurea and um, 
both in the echinacea family. But bugs and birds and stuff are looking for a purple coneflower, not a yellow coneflower. And so there's question as whether they're going to recognize that. So if you're going to do it as a decorative piece, that's fine, or watch it. I'm, um, last year I put out 10 different um, plants of two different species to a bunch of my friends. So there's a, uh, it's, I'm trying to think of the name of it, um, Aganash. Um, but it, in the native one grows six feet tall and wants to flop over. So no one wants that one. So when I'm doing landscaping, it's a very attractive plant. They came up with a cultivar that's short. So I gave 10 of them out to 10 different people to watch over the season. I have one in my house to see if the birds and the butterflies are going to use it or not. So we're going to try to learn from some of these species. Um, there's a, that orange coneflower I showed you, or the orange milkweed I showed you. There, there's a yellow one. And it's called Mellow Yellow, I think, with the name on it. That one is supposed to be still used by monarchs. I haven't tried it yet, but um, that's what you're, you're finding. It's called a cultivar, where they took the plant and they've cultivated it off. So it gained something and it lost something. And we don't know what it lost. We, we can see the visible thing that it changed. They have double flowers or it has, um, it may have lost some of them. Um, Pixie Meadow Bright is like an orange coneflower. That doesn't come back. White swan, a white coneflower, doesn't come back well. So then you're buying a $10 plant that's probably going to die next year. And then you say, well, I bought a coneflower and it died. Well, you know, we didn't stay with the solid one that we know of. So you take a chance if you go off. Other questions? Otherwise, thank you. Come up and get information. I've got cards and all kinds of information for you.